I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The uh, first item is uh, appeal of a water bill for 12 minutes. We haven't had anything like this before, so uh, <laughs> yeah, we've, had a, we've had a lot of interesting water bills before, but I've never actually had anything to come to a uh, board meeting to talk about them. Um, to, to add some interest to it. Um, the following bill, we always, the 20 years we have these bills, we've always between two or three hundred dollars. Yeah. The bill immediately following this from uh, September through December, 266.04. The bill I just received, 266.04. So it seems like the meter's working. <laughs> or, yeah. or not. Well, we will, yeah, we will actual reading. Yeah, right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. But it, yeah. it doesn't seem like, you know, like this, we've had it where. You know, uh, we found that the meter was bad, but it seems like the meter's okay. Or, or maybe it picked up from the next door. Well, we sent a person manually to check it. If Jim English Bay superintendent went right. more than once to check it. Right, and they came back and we, uh, you know, we, we knew the building was empty, and they checked to make sure there were... Yeah. Um, we had no plumbing repairs or anything done, and... Over the summer, my office is closed for about three weeks, so we're using even less water. We used a fair amount of water, but sure. we were out for three weeks. One of the apartments was completely empty, and one, one pair of tenants are two younger kids from Vermont who are real water conscious. And the third floor, for two weeks it was our, our kids, and for a month and a half, two months before that, another couple from Dobbs with their two kids that also claimed to be water friendly. So, we don't know where it went to, yeah. unless, and the possibility is there, and this, our driveway is access for the building next door. And I caught them just about ready to drop the over there, and they've been in and out with all sorts of deliveries and everything. We don't have a water faucet out back, and they were power washing all summer, you know, repointing, power washing. It's possible, I, I didn't see anything, but there are plenty of times that I'm not there when mm -hmm. they were. Still a lot of water. It is. I mean, <laughs> once, once we had a leak about two years ago, and it went and reported to us for about a month and a half. And as soon as we heard about it, we brought the plumber in, and he said, that was a leak. That was like the faucet was like wide open. And at that point, a month and a half, we went wide open, our bill was 900 Yeah. So $3,500 is a huge <clears throat> water. So we can't imagine where it went to. Do we know what the burner bill is? Water bill for what? During that time period, I was asking if you know what the Burnham building water bills are like during that time period oh. when they were doing that excess. Well, how many meters does the building have? Do you know that? Burnham building? Yeah. I had to look into that. There's, I'm sure there's one for library and one for the tenants. Right. What, you know, one consolidated for the tenants. I had asked Jim if it was possible that they accidentally picked up next door. Burnham building instead of ours and sent us. Said it's not possible, yeah. but I don't know the technology for it. Yeah, everything's keyed by serial number. Mm -hmm. So the serial number of the meter. So. Yeah. I, you know, I guess, well, I did check with yeah. uh, Rosemary. Yeah. I did ask her today, and she uh, didn't um, meet with workforce management, who's you know, the yeah, the manager there, there, right? And. Um, the person there checked with the people, and he, the workers at the time, and they all um, claimed that they did not use it. So. And then uh, we checked also with DQW to make sure that there was no use, you know. So no one's coming forward to say that they used it or any knowledge of it. Yeah, we need to see the bills for both of the meters on the Burnham building during probably the interval before and after, during and after, just to see if there's any anomalies there. Especially if they're outside power washing, that's taking a lot of water. I don't know what, I don't think the other building next to you would have any chance 
of using that much water, right? And then the, the building on the, oh, the, the other, other side, side, not the yeah. earth, the yes. other side. That's apartments. Yeah. I wouldn't think it would use it. Um, yeah, so we, we, can, we can look at that and, yeah, give us some more thought. Um, and, you know, capacity, I think. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things where um, I would say this is our 10th year. I saw your anniversary <laughs> pop up, our 10th year on the board. I think those 10 years we probably had about at least half dozen kind of strange um, mm -hmm. bills pop up. Yeah. Um, I would say five of the six of them, or actually yeah, maybe all of them, had some kind of underlying leak. You know, it was either a sprinkler head or um, some of them were astronomical, you know, like yeah. $20,000 or, you know. Um, so, um, you know, this is just a weird one that there's, I know we went one, one was a toilet running for, mm -hmm. you know, for a quarter. But, Jim Mingles be something, he found it right away. He's like, yeah. you hear that little noise? That's yeah. your toilet running. And it was like, you know, their bill was 200 and it was like 1900 or something from a toilet running. So, you know, it's, it's this is the first time we've kind of had, you know, something where there hasn't been any, you know, kind of, uh, you know, viable theory. Um, and I think it's just, it's just tough to just say, you know, don't worry about it because then every time someone has that high bill, it's right. going to be, it's going to be yeah. difficult. So, so I think, you know, you could take a look at the burden bill. Burning buildings and builds, and uh, we can, you know, try to come up with something. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. Okay. I, yeah, appreciate, we appreciate your uh, and your patience as we work through this, and uh, you know. I guess the out. reason that came, you know, I, I thought of this particularly was because so often, I don't know what percent of the times, it's the the outdoor um, lawn care <laughs> sprinkler system. Mm -hmm at the end of the summer and then it's like you go back you go oh yeah well that was turned on and it was turned on you know by people that i was away for them and it was but you don't have a giant three acre lawn last, last summer was particularly wet so and i didn't it, ever do much water even if there. it were dry how much in your use, right? in your back parking lot could you yeah. sprinkle for things to so i realize the precedent issue is but it, it just seemed like a strange outlier and it's mm -hmm. it, you know, if it were, if your highest bill with a problem was ever 900, I, I right. can't imagine yeah, that you could, you could have used more than that. But I, I, I'm certainly happy to, to think mm -hmm. about investigating, as Mark suggests. I, I've only heard, yeah. incidentally, about one other problem that I'm going to have to go find out more about. I didn't get a chance, but uh, it's a problem that happened a while back where it was traced to. Uh, a mix-up of meters, uh -huh. but I'm not sure what time period that was, and I, I know it was like over five years ago, so... Um, Do you remember that? I don't I, I kind of remember something that you're... I will talk to the person who okay. was mentioning it to me and try to get some more details about what actually... I think it triggered the audit, if I remember right, which we did an audit of all the, all the accounts. And it turned out that one, I think somehow they, uh, for a period of time or some other, the numbers have gotten swapped. Yeah, it was an incorrect serial number written down. Yeah. But again, you know, that that doesn't happen and then you get changed back. Yeah, right. back right. After a month, you know what I mean, or three months. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I, I remember the situation you're talking about. But another, but also he doesn't, you know, he doesn't have, uh, I'm assuming he didn't have standing water in the building or around the building, yeah. which given that lot, you know, I would think. It's not so much. Yeah, not, not much uh, place to store that much water. Yeah. Yeah. And the basement was dry all summer. Okay. Well, we'll look at the. One more, more, one more part the, of the investigation. <laughs> <laughs> you get to come back, I guess. Every day I call you, you have to come back. Right. Or, um, I know, and and great that you, you know, Larry and Brenda. I know you spend a lot of time on this, and you know this, but I think it's important. <laughs> Thanks very much for coming out. Thanks. 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 So, what it, what's the, the, next one, the next step here? Is we'll get back to you with the data, and yeah, if right. it's in, if it's in time, I suspect for the uh, Monday, April fifteenth meeting. I, I don't think it's going to take us long to get some more I don't know information. How many days of power washing were done? Yeah, we have to follow up on a few things. The occupancy of the building and the days when they were done. Right. Yeah. Then we get some more information. Yeah. Okay. okay. As soon as we have it, we'll come back. Uh, next is review of draft zoning for North, North Broadway. Give us a couple minutes just to get set up here. Sure. Just to. Put that. No, we're going to take that one. <laughs>
I'm tired. Thanks, Brenda. You're welcome. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ye
So, does anyone else have a feeling? I can't about? remember why oh, we did Yeah, we didn't because we were the, the focus was on the large, the, the large lots on the large lots which was open space on Broadway, and those aren't. They're all. They're, well, those are all it, and it's five and not on Broadway. But six has access to Broadway. Yeah. Well. Well, let's, I think we need to proceed. Six, and what are you talking about? Which is five? Yeah, five. Five is the Holy Spirit. Five is the Holy Spirit, six is that house. Yeah. Well, they have access to secondary roads, but... Well, doesn't five have access to... Well, five, so... Four. Yeah, so they have access there. So they have there. access to Broadway. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing. Yeah. 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 That's the reasoning. All right. Well, they well, have access to the city. And that they were also... From a zoning perspective, leaving that block to go up into this into a higher density than the rest of the area is crazy. This is crazy stuff. So what is it built out though? It's only got two buildings on it. I thought I thought houses are on oh, no. no they're on no, the, the next so oh, the one at the very end has a house on it, but the the other one's still anyways, let's keep going. Okay, so just an overview of as you know the property slopes uh, up from the logway. Uh, there are some areas of steep slopes, those are purple. The only area that has any wetlands on it is the blue line that's going across the top, so it's, it's pretty dry. Where's the blue line going across the top? Oh, it's sorry. Sunnyside Creek, right? Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. The top, right right up here. Here. top yeah. of the hill, the top of the yeah, street. Yeah, so it's the, okay. the peak of the bridge is um, on the Holy Spirit property, and then everything slopes down to Broadway. This is an elevation of 440, and it goes down to an elevation of 210. So this is an overview of all of the existing parcels that are um, in the rezoning area. Um, so this, the lots range in, range in size from one acre to 17.767 acres. Um, the smallest lots are the ones owned by Irvington Equities and then the access piece for the Holy Spirit site. Um, the Stanley Rubenzall property is four acres. The KDF Holdings property is 8.1 acres. Uh, and then the Abbott House is on the larger end. It's uh, almost 17 acres. Um, the existing building coverages on these lots range from 2.66% all the way up to 10.33%, and that's uh, lot number three, the Urban Chase Equities property, which is only a one-acre parcel. Um, right now, the FAR on the properties range from 0.06 to 026 so on the larger properties, the FAR is relatively low, relatively low building coverage. And then the only ones where they're you know, on the higher end are the, the lots three and four, which are the, the smaller one acre parts. So what is that little sliver lot between one and six? Okay, so this parcel right here is a um, single family home right now. And that's, uh, that's about a one acre property. It's currently undersized for the lot. So what I'm recommending for that lot is to actually rezone it back to 1F20 instead of including it with this rezoning. Uh, because 1F20 is right here, and these are all single family homes, and I don't, it doesn't seem like that property is right for development. And so bringing it back into this zoning district would just make sense. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Which, which road is it that's going up uh, to that? That's on Strawberry Lane. Lane. That's Strawberry Lane. Yes, yeah, so this is Strawberry Lane, and then this is Rock. Those are the folks that had all the problem with Strawberry Lane. Looked bright here at the time. Yes, visibility bright. Oh, uh, correct. Was the family that? No, I don't think. Yes. Is it the right piece? Yes. Oh, okay. I think it was. I thought it was. No, they're right behind. They're right behind, they're right behind Max. Behind Max. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So in the draft rezoning, which are uh, the highlights, so it creates yeah, a... We get, we, oh, sorry. Ashley, just go back a minute, because just... No, the, 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 to explain to the board which is which properties, because we know them all by different names. Right. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So, no, 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 that's okay. I'll do it. You wouldn't know that. Okay. So six is... Six, you know, there's the Abbott House. Um, in front of that is what we call... It was Max on property. Next to that is Carrot Yellow. And then... Um, what's down there is KDF Holdings, is the uh, is the house that used to be part of the Carafiello property, but it's now it's the house on Broadway. And then, okay, and then the rest is Holy, Holy Spirit. So do that again. I'm just yeah, right. Okay. And, uh, and, sorry, did I miss No, no, I'm sorry, Kate. 
Yeah. What's the number? KF is Carafiello. KF is Carafiello. Yes. Yeah. The uh, site number two. The Rubens R one, where it says Rubens R, the right. one is the Nick. That's site number one. Okay. Three, Everton Equities. Yes, the old Carafiello, the White House. No, no. No, oh, I'm sorry. That's the, the one. That's the oh, office building. That's the office building closest to Broadway. Yeah, yeah that's the Broadway. <laughs> and then uh, the two Holy Spirit Association so and, then, and then the other house. Right. And, and then the single-family house is the is Ravens. Rabies. Rabies, right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> right. okay. So this is just an overview of the zoning. It creates a new mixed-use corridor district. Um, the new uses that are proposed are the ones that are reflected in the comprehensive plan update. So that includes multifamily and townhomes, assisted living, hotels, office, research and design, full-service restaurants, places of worship, membership clubs, bed and breakfast, and small practice medical office. Uh, and there are some new definitions proposed to, to the code, a new definition for um, medical office large practice, and that is um, to try to control traffic, a large medical practice, like you might have at West Med is a major traffic generator versus a you know, smaller um, family-oriented practice. I think we call it boutique hotels. Uh, can we use the term boutique hotels in the comprehensive plan as opposed to hotel? Yes. Okay. I'm just okay. We could. I could change. I mean, it has a different. Well, but yeah. I mean, it, there is a. Um, Maybe that's not what. I'm the there's, a the there's a limit on the number of, of hotel rooms you could have that would keep it in the boutique <laughs> hotel range. So, I don't know what that number is. Um, the cap that's proposed in the zoning is 150 rooms. Yes, I agree with that. Exactly. Um, also a definition proposed for office use, which to separate that out from medical office. All of the uses would be special permit uses. None of them would be as of right. And that special permit is issued by? By the planning board. I mean, that's how it's drafted. Right. Yeah, I know. Too. yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> no, but it, it could be whichever board. Sure. So no use, no new use is viable without a special permit, effectively. Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, so the proposed zoning builds on the existing resource protection um, regulations that you have in your code. So that separates um, any of the steep slopes or gives a, a credit for steep slopes. It takes out any wetlands as developable area. Uh, so that brings down your net buildable site area. Um, so all of the, any of the residential development that would be allowed under this zoning would be required to prepare a resource protection analysis, and there's some new um, dimensional criteria proposed for that section that would be applicable to this zoning district, and those thresholds are based on what you currently have in the MF district, so there's precedent for that. Um, the building coverage for all development would be based on the net buildable site area, um, so that would also reduce, will keep development out of um, steep slopes, wetlands, and so on. Um, the max lot coverage would be 25% and the maximum building coverage would be 20%. So what can happen in that 5% difference is your surface parking, um, patios, that sort of thing. Uh, the maximum FAR is currently proposed at 0.25. That's based on the growth site area, not the net buildable area. How does that differ from our current interpretation of FAR if the residential? Um, I think it's a little different. I think your current FAR may be based on the new net buildable area. I'd have to double check that. No, I think it's on the net buildable area, but the number, the percent, I think you wanted to know about the percentage. No, it's a different right? percentage. I was wondering if it was net or gross, actually. I know it's a different percentage. Okay, I'll look. There's a, go on. Okay. Um, so there's a minimum setback of 125 feet from, from Broadway for a two-story building and a 250-foot setback for a three-story building. So either the whole building could be set all the way back or you could have a stepped building that was two stories after 125 feet and then go up. Um, and the regulations include uh, design regulations and flexible parking regulations. Because uh, we don't want to 
not have a situation here where the code requires an excessive amount of parking. It would want it to be based on the actual use that was proposed. Some of the sanity check stuff I want to talk about is thinking about the um, uh, the bright view proposal as the, the, the latest one we had for this area. And they were talking about a three-story building that was, what, was that 200 or 250 setback? Does anyone remember that? I don't remember. I looked today. I think it. What is this one? Two fifty. Two fifty, right? For, yeah. So, but that was a, a, a three-story building, and um, so part of my concerns about is moving any. You know, we have we need to think. That's not to you, but just to the board. About we need to think about whether or not a two-story facade, one hundred twenty-five feet back, is how that's going to impact the open space, the feel of the space. Because we look. There's a 125 foot setback line, and you can see that if you were to build a building in that area, if you were on the Brightview property, it's extremely sloped in that area. So I don't know which you get away with, but I think we did some depictions. We did. We did. Yeah. Yeah. Nancy, why are you looking for them? I mean, no. Um, uh, FAR is based on gross, gross um, sales of them. Um, and then then it, none of it pulled at varies from about point one to five to point. 12 and a half to 43 percent. Yeah, okay. So there were two reasons why I had recommended the 125 feet. One is that's the, the current setback for Broadway in your code, but also it aligns with the existing building here on the, I think the Carrot Yellow property. Is the old right? yeah. Former. Um, and also on this property, there's a pretty flat area right here where there's an existing parking lot. So if you were to, on this site, add a new building and keep the existing building, that would be a reasonable site to develop if you just wanted to add one building. Well, um, now you, but in this case, you should. See, this is what confused me because in this case, you showed an additional building, but it's actually on the ridge line right behind the old yeah, number two, which is not going to be buildable there. So I was getting confused why some of the examples were showing places that you knew were, were already rejected because the amount of, uh, uh, you know, uh, Rock removal and impact on steep slopes would occur. So that area that on two is a steep slope area that's uh, was already effectively direct right field was rejected as any kind of development of that area due to both environmental issues but also due to cost of rock removal. So your little so, your little purple grid is saying that's a little purple um, yeah. rectangle. Right. So let's let's hear it out. Yeah. yeah let me yeah, go back. Oh, yeah. The concern more realistic would be that it would in fact be in the front. Okay. So we can. Yep. Um, so just to go over what gross uh, floor area, what FAR is. So it's the gross floor area divided by the lot area. The gross floor area includes is measured from the exterior face of the building and includes all of your livable space. And the lot area is measured from property line to property line. So in terms of what this would look like, um, these are six different examples of how you, uh, this is assuming this lot is completely flat and no wetlands. But if, so if you had a one acre lot that was completely flat with no wetlands and you wanted a 0.25 FAR and 20% building coverage, these are six different ways you could configure that on a lot. So it, it essentially encourages you to go up as opposed to go out, uh, which is a way to encourage a developer to uh, so the building. What are the rules on, F go back to the previous slide, the rules on FAR for basements, what's the rule on that? Mm -hmm. The reason I'm asking is because, again, Brightville was proposing a sub-grade fourth floor at one point. Uh, okay, so if it was a livable space, it would, it would be, be a usable, would be workable space. counted towards your FAR. Mm -hmm. So how are they going to get away with that? I was not able to keep proposing it. So it was they would propose be... their own zoning as well. Yeah, so. that's, I guess that was must have been the way to get around it. Okay. No, yeah. well, also, in our code, we only have FAR for, for residential. For residential. This proposes it for its other uses. Oh, okay, good. So. Okay. okay. Makes sense. So this shows um, what the build out is under the existing zoning. Um, so there's two different development scenarios here. One is if you were to develop it as an institutional use, which is the other permitted use in this district. So that's the um, that's this column here. 
So if you were an institutional use, um, you can have 15% lot coverage. You can go up to three stories. So it ends up being a, a maximum gross floor area of 78,000 square feet. But if you're a residential use, uh, there's a variable um, FAR calculation depending on your lot size and coverage. Uh, so that works out to a range of uh, 0.09 FAR on lot two, all the way up to 0.34 FAR on uh, lot three. So there's, there's quite a range. I'm oh, sorry. That was sorry. Okay. So the potential build out under the proposed zoning, um, it's now capped at a 0.25 FAR. Um, so you end up with a maximum gross floor area of 40,000. 43,000 square feet on lot one, up to, um, and then 88,000 square feet on lot two, uh, about 11,000 square feet on lot three, 12,000 square feet on lot four. Those two lots are essentially built out under the, the proposed zoning, so you wouldn't necessarily see those redeveloped. Um, lot five would, would be about 192,000 square feet, and lot six is 184,000 square feet. Um, so those are fairly large properties. Those are 16-acre and 17-acre properties. Um, once you factor the net buildable site area, um, which is what your maximum building coverage would be based on, that brings down the development footprint. Um, but the reason that I recommend not tying the FAR to that is that it, it um, it really constricts the amount of development that you could potentially build up if you were to tie the FAR to the uh, net buildable site area. Uh, Ashley, would you explain that again? Sure. So, it might be easier with a photo. Okay, so the net buildable site area takes out any of the wetlands, steep slopes out of your equation. So. You want to keep your footprint out of those areas, but you don't necessarily want to keep the developer from being able to go up. So if you were to tie your FAR to the net buildable site area, you'd have to have a higher FAR. Um, right, right, I guess. And on a site that maybe doesn't have a lot of resources, um, that could sort of overinflate the development. So if you tie it to the whole site, um, I think that's a better way of doing it. It's also how it's done otherwise in the code. Right. So it's consistent, yes. Okay, so on the four columns to the right, those are just conceptual um, figures of what you could potentially build with that gross floor area. So we took a look at what could reasonably fit on the site in terms of the box and then apply what you know average hotel room sizes, um, average assisted living unit sizes to that, and then just divide it. We apply a factor of 15% to that gross floor area to account for corridors, common spaces that wouldn't be leasable, and then divided the leasable number by the averages for those different types of uses. So you end up with, um, we have in the four columns on the right the approximately how many hotel rooms you would get on a site, approximately how many uh, assisted living units you would get, skilled nursing, memory care, or a multifamily conversion. Uh, and some of those sites, which are on, on the larger end, um, because of the gross floor area that would be allowed, uh, there's a cap that's in place on the total number of units that would be allowed. So, you know, all the ones that have the 150 with the three stars, they hit the cap. Can you explain the last column? Yes. So one of the concepts in this draft is to allow the conversion of the existing buildings on the property to multifamily. Um, and that is based on a, a minimum um, unit size of 675 square feet. So this is what they could do without build, without additional building? Without additional building. So if they were to convert the existing building on the site from an office building to a multifamily building, it would have to have a minimum unit size of 675 square feet. And uh, that's approximately how many units you could, you could get. Just as a sanity check, you know, when we were talking about, right here again, we were thinking that the range of 
units should be 80 to 90 MEPC. And this, of course, that was mixed with a memory care units, right? So it was not just assisted living, if I remember correctly. But it's in the same ballpark that we were thinking made sense for that property. Yeah, one of the challenges with this rezoning area is you have such a variability in your lot sizes. You go from one acre to 18 acres, so finding the happy medium it can be a little, it works for all the sites. <laughs> it can be a little dirty. So that 150 number of that you said would be capped, is that by your proposal? By the proposal. By your proposal. Yeah, right. so that's actually in the draft tax is the cap. Looking at those Google boutique hotels, it's okay. like it's 10 to 100 mm -hmm. units is typically a boutique okay, hotel. Okay, so it's a It's a hotel. It's a hotel. <laughs> Unless we wanted to find it as a boutique and had more percent to 100. But, yeah, but so boutique so. rooms have to be three times as big. <laughs> so. No, it's just the sheet town. It's the, the red count on the sheets. On the number of multifamily converting, is it like a real number? Why would if it, why would anybody do that? Why? Oh, I guess no. I take that back. So I that's think just to establish like, your cap, it, and it's really for something like the Abbott House. Yeah, you're not going to take that building it, down because yeah, it already is higher than anything you could build in the village. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Um, Okay, but it's sorry, okay. And six is at the house? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then all the other uh, ones that say NA, you need to have a minimum lot size of four acres to be able to even do that. So that's why it would, it, you couldn't do assisted living on the one acre parcels. Actually, just um, thinking back to Mark's original question about a potential number seven for the other Holy Spirit property. Mm -hmm. I'd sort of be curious to know where it fits into those numbers if, you know, perhaps going forward you can let us know. I can run the calculation from that, yeah. They're all subdivided in one lots. Oh, they already are. Yeah, they already are. Okay, I So, actually, what I'm sorry, go back to that once more on the conversion thing. They were subdivided about 20 years ago. Why would it? 15 years ago. Yeah. They're odd shaped. What, what, yeah. what, are, what are three or four? Those are, this, those are the two small lots. Those are two small lots. Right. Yeah. Why couldn't they could be converted to multifamily? I understand why it's not, not applicable for any of the assisted living. I don't. I'm not sure. I, I thought I had a minimum lot acreage of four acres on that one as well, but. No, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. So my, I don't know that there needs to be. I mean, because why? What would be the pro? You know, if somebody did want to convert that house yeah, yeah. Yeah, to, to multifamily, right? So yeah. three and four yeah. potentially yeah. skilled nursing, but not multi. No, but yeah, just the, it's just the last count, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah. So I just would put not. I would put in numbers for that. Okay. 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 So I just picked up my. Name. So right now the buildings on those sites are one is a, a, a eleven thousand square feet and the other is about thirty five hundred square feet. So you could potentially convert. Right. Those that would be buildings. that would be a good number to have. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. It's good, especially if they could be affordable. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so this is getting, uh, this first example is one additional building per lot. Um, this would max out the FAR. It would not ma max out the uh, building footprint. And this is a second example. This, is, this was not, you know, not before, but this is if you were to add one or two buildings per lot. So just mostly just on the Holy Spirit site. If you didn't want to have one large building, if you wanted to do two smaller buildings that were maybe multifamily, um, and this is what that would, would look like. So this is a bird's eye view going southbound on um, Broadway. The ones that are labeled 5A and 5B are the Holy Spirit property, 6 is Abbott House, um, Four is the former Care Gallo property, one is the Maxon property, and two is the Brighton site. Uh, so these properties. Where is this intersection now? Is this from 
A drone above East Side. Uh, what is this? Sunny Side? East Sunny Side. Sunny side. Roughly. You're higher than you would be. In You're higher than you would be in, in real life. So this is oh, sure. What's the existing that one? Yeah. That's the Holy Spirit Comfort Center. Oh, never so this is the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <Spirit's laughs> <Spirit's laughs> yeah. know the right so one of the limitations yeah. of using this was all done. It was SketchUp and Google Earth, and one of the limitations of that software is if you get too close, um, the buildings get ex and the trees get really pixelated, and so it's can't get an accurate street view from it, but um, so this is Broadway, and yeah, that's the Holy Spirit property. Uh, but again, one, two, and four, the, the feeling I'm getting, you know, is there very tall in the front that's facing Broadway, and then they narrow it as they move up to the hill. So all of the examples in this concept plan are three stories. Uh, this is what it would look like, the bird's eye view looking straight out from Broadway, so you can see the existing, um, the existing building on the Brightview site. So you can see, in context of that, it's really, they're really not much Where's, taller than what you have. Broadway so Broadway's right. running this way. Yeah, right. So we're somewhere above the aqueduct. So you're above. This is, it's a bird's eye view. So that green stripe near the bottom is the aqueduct, then? Yes. That's uh -huh. one. Aqueduct. This is the aqueduct. Oh, Broadway's about so right here. Okay. And the and the number two is is the place that that you're saying, Mark, is it's a really high on the hill. So it's more likely this that is perhaps would be that's right. Not a, would that's be right. Very broad. But, it, but it couldn't be three stories if it was that close. It couldn't be three stories if it was within 120, within 250 feet. Yeah. But those are all yeah, those are all three stories. This is the northbound from Broadway. So again, this is the, the Abbott House property. Um, that's the Maxon property. And then in the back there is the Holy Spirit properties. This is an example of showing one new building per lot. So in this example, we use the basically generally the footprint of the existing development. So in this example, it would be all new construction. This is maxing out the development footprint as opposed to um, maxing out the FAR and going just just going up. Mm -hmm. um, so in this case, uh, you're looking at mostly uh, well, it's a range of on lot one, it's 1.28 stories. So the front half is one story, the back half is two stories. Um, and then some of the other larger properties, the um, it's two and a half stories. So where you see the little line is where the, the portion would go up to, to two stories. And in all of these instances, we had the one story on the Broadway side and the two story or the third story um, in the back. So they become tear downs. So this would be a tear. This is a tear down scenario. So you can see this is Broadway here, it's another bird's eye view, but the buildings would be stepped back and up. This is the east view. So again, this is Broadway's running right about here. So how are we forcing the step up only because they are, it's rebuilding and they are trying to maximize so in this one, I wanted to show the worst case scenario for the building coverage. So that's the 20%. And then you'd max out the FAR, so that's what so gets you the step up building. Yeah. I don't think this is the most likely scenario. I think it's more likely to have a smaller footprint and go up to two or three stories. Okay. Is there any way to get visuals without the trees and leaf so that we can see what it's going to look like in the winter? <laughs> yeah, yes, I can show you. Um, I can show you what these looked like before. Uh, they're flat, but yeah, I can. It's worse than that, though, because this is not a real. We're up. You're not seeing this except from a helicopter. Yeah, this you're in a helicopter. Yeah, I mean, this is actually pro this is actually mm -hmm. more than you would this see. This makes it look worse. It makes it look worse. worse. Yeah. It makes it look yeah. worse. Yeah, because yeah. you're in a helicopter. You're not on the road or walking. Yeah, yeah. I have the model. I can I can pull up the model as well. You better idea. So, what do you, just just informally, what do you do in the code to force more of a layer cake approach rather than a monolithic three-story buildings? Is there something you can do to? Well, we have what we have in there right now is the set 
setbacks for, you know, the variable setback for your height. So that's one thing to give you a layer cake approach. Um, but obviously the buildings that uh, Abbott has uh, don't have that characteristic, right? There's no Broadway footage, uh, frontage, so. Right, so in that case, you could potentially have um, a three-story building that would just, you know, go a lot. Yeah, that's right. Like, I know these are very sort of monolithic looking things. Right. But what, what, what you know, not being architecturally inclined, what one of the concerns I'm thinking about is we may, may be forcing redevelopment of, of structures that don't necessarily fit in with the you know, existing architecture that's surrounding it. Like how do you get a layer cake in a colonial style home or <laughs> Or I'm thinking about what we also have right. people have expressed that they want Broadway to look like when they're driving down. Sure. And one of the nice things about that White House is it looks like a White House that fits in, you know, even though it's outmoded and that needs to be replaced. But I'm just worried that these sort of, of regulations may be forcing sort of a different kind of architecture that fits no to fit well, in. This type of nice. building would require a lot more grading and excavation than if you were to have a smaller footprint and go up. Um, you know, one of the reasons I'm suggesting a larger building coverage than what, you know, if you were to have a building coverage that was directly proportional to your FAR, if you had a building coverage of 0.2, if you had a building coverage of 20%, your FAR, and the proportional FAR would be like 0.6 FAR, but by bringing the FAR down to 0.25, uh, you're allowing some flexibility there of either adding, keeping the existing buildings on the site and adding one new building, or if you were to redevelop, I think it encourages you to go up as opposed to going out. And then there's also design regulations within the proposal that includes um, architectural features and tying it to the character of the community as well. Remember, if you remember, right, they did have two and three stories, but they had some of the three-story areas set back. Mm -hmm. And they kind of unified it by making it look like a cluster of smaller buildings, mm -hmm. stylistically. Eventually. Eventually, right. <laughs> but that's where they got to. I'm just with your head. With or without, that's where they ended up. This is the northbound view of that same layout. So this Third example is if, um, and this is if you were to go uh, possibly the multifamily route, you had a series of buildings, uh, townhouses maybe, or multifamily. Um, so in this example, uh, all the buildings are three stories. It does not max out the development footprint on any of the lots. Um, and, just, and this also assumes full, full redevelopment. So again, you know, it looks, and from a bird's eye view, you're, you're seeing a lot of buildings. When you're down at street level, you're not going to be, be seeing the massing at this level. Uh, this is the head-on view. And then this is the northbound bird's eye view. Um, I can pull up the, the new model. Actually, I have it here. Be connected. So we have we have public. Well, we have public Wi-Fi here. If you want to. So choose. Public. No, public. And then there's a password, which is public password. It's it's uh, all lowercase Irvington. One zero five three three.
I apologize if this makes anyone dizzy. It's, it's So this is that site where you were concerned about the building being behind. It is possible that it would be right in here instead yeah. where the parking lot is. Um, but as you can see, as you go down Broadway now, it's you really can't see very far back at all when you. Um, don't worry. All right. Well, what is that? <laughs> This really wasn't cutting as long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's make it as long as All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's All right. Well, so, it was, yeah. anyway, because of the way it slips back, once you get back, back behind that original row of buildings, you're really not, you're really not seeing much. So you're seeing a lot more in this bird's eye view than you would in, in yeah, reality. It's really hard to tell, though. Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah. I, I think this is potentially useless in terms of I not this isn't a criticism of you at all, but in terms of having a sense of what the what? Yeah. No. <laughs> what? what I'm starting to say is that in terms of trying to decide the visibility of the massing, if you're you know, 50 feet up in the air, and it's a much different experience than if you're at ground level. Yeah, it is. Um, so we, what we could do is some site sections to give you an idea of how everything's set back. Um, that would be helpful. I think so. Yeah. yeah. I think it should be different problem. ways of visualizing. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Right. Actually, let me, sh I'll send you, right here we actually done some um, good one, some street view, what, what, um, tools they used, I don't know, but maybe you'd be able to tell, and I, I, I'll, I'll send them to you. Okay. But are, are we going to talk about the architectural elements that uh, Larry Wonky brought up, and also the, any, anything related to the preservation of those um, historic buildings? Or is that not part of your domain to discuss? So there are um, design regulations included okay. in the draft draft zoning okay. that relate to the lighting, um, landscaping, and screening. Can you show them? Yes, those are all starting on page four of the draft zoning that we emailed. Um, I have one extra copy. I have it probably over here, but it's just some of the capacity on this one. Oh, sure. You said it's page page like, four of the draft zoning. I don't think I have a different thing in front of me. No, this is the zoning. It's in the same thing. Just keep going. 
Dark sky lighting, which I know makes more. Kind of that, the historic, if, if you look at the bottom of the page on the considerations and granting the special permits, it says existing built. One of the things you have to take into account is that existing buildings that, that reflect the historic character of the village should be maintained or adaptively to be used to the greatest extent. Okay, uh, here's the other thing existing stone walls shall be maintained. Right. Sorry, I'm missing that. This is page five. On the bottom of page five. Okay. So before we talked about giving some or elsewhere in our code, do we not have giving them some sort of coverage benefit for uh, maintaining historic structures or was that just on a case by case basis? Like at uh Donato Dalton. That was that's not in here. I understand. Yes, it was just in that zone. Yeah. I mean, we talked about doing something that would actually encourage people to maintain the existing buildings. Right now, there's no net benefit in maintaining the existing buildings. Okay. Well, Not except that it's a requirement for getting a special permit. So you're thinking like a density bonus? No, I don't know what I'm thinking right now. But yeah, I mean, okay. we did give a bit of a bonus, but I think there's something we can get back to. But I, I, as I recall, that was sort of, we were trying to make it work. Yeah, I'm just wondering, you know, there's not that many properties where, I mean, you, I mean, the real way to protect these buildings is to designate them. And that's, and we did pass that, that. Yeah, we're not going to designate oh. them against the owners. Uh, right, yeah, that's true. That's right. Right. That's a but there is, I don't know, that's a protection that they have to reflect the historic character of the village shall be maintained or adaptively be used to the greatest extent that I mean, short of not, you know, not short of designating it. And you have both the planning board and the architectural review board involved in this. Yeah, yes. well, 
Yeah, read that section. Right? Yeah, so then yeah, the after those things. Um, so does the planning board during its site development review of the proposed erection or exterior alteration of a building or structure in the mixed use corridor district shall refer the application to the Board of Architecture Review for comments prior to issuance of a decision to approve or deny an application. This referral shall not limit any other powers granted by the Board of Architecture Review under the Village Code. Which, okay. the, the reason that was put in because ordinarily it would go to the architectural review board later and also the planning board is asked to be looking at these things that it doesn't ordinarily look at or some of the stuff that looks at but some it doesn't it has more teeth if it's part of the special permit to right. the design regulations so that's what it's going to in the past, the problem has been exactly when does the ARB get a chance to talk about it? You know, if it comes too late in the process, it's too late in the process. So in this case, it would be during the special permit review process. So before the special it's permit and site plan are issued. Yeah. It would be earlier it's on. Yeah, that came up. I think, I think we got this from another section with the, uh, with the railroad building. We wrote right. that in. Right. Well, I, I would keep Mark's thought um, active about um, some kind of bonus or special consideration for um, the property that has a historic building on it and, and what's done with it. Um, I mean, it would be nice if the owner would say, yeah, we'd like to designate it um, as a local landmark and then go through that process yeah. in our law. But if that didn't happen, then is there some greater advantage to the owner to treat it with respect beyond, you know, beyond its practical or whatever the... Yeah, the, the, the building, I think building on what you just said, so if somebody has a property that we would like to designate, right, mm -hmm. we ask the owner, the owner says no, mm -hmm. then the owner has to go to the planning board and the architectural review board and convince them that this other use that requires taking down the building we would like to designate is really worth it. Right. Or, or altering it or, you know, not. No, I guess. Mean, I mean, to give you an example, on the, on the, um, on the Brightview application mm -hmm. on that here at the yellow property, I don't know if you know, but there's some, there's a nice stone building right, right on the right right Broadway. And then there's yeah. two really nice ones in the back. Okay. And um, we would like them, the village would like them not to be taken down. Yeah, and, and there may be other there may be other things on other properties, but that's just so the one that's ones are most yeah. And and so I actually it wasn't just on Denard. I think on that one we also talked about yeah, yeah. some kind of a um, um, well, he, you know a, whether a, a coverage bonus or something. Like they wouldn't they wouldn't count. And I'll I'll look for what we did on that. Okay. I'll, I'll look. What about affordable housing? We account. also talked about them. Yes. Yeah. 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 We, we have language for different kind of bonuses. Mm -hmm. You can have a bonus for keeping a historic building. I forget. Was there was I think for that property, and then it didn't go forward. So I'll, I'll look for it and send it to you. Okay. okay. So which one is talking these? about something along those lines? Yeah, exactly. I don't know what it is. I don't think it should be just blindly got more coverage because that worked against us at the. No, I would say instead of giving more coverage, give more MAR. So, um, the question, uh, it, yeah, because we got maybe overly dense at. Uh, on the fee property, when it, I think it went above 20, uh, point two, I think it went to uh, up about 20 percent, right? It was like 22 percent by the time everything was in. <clears throat> and that's what that created, uh, adding that piece of property down the bottom. Too. Yeah, it's, kind of, yeah, it's very creative. So um, my question was about affordable housing. Which of these uses, and Mary, you probably could know the answer from, based on the code, but which of these uses would require uh, affordable housing component. Well, any any development of multi-family that's got more than five. Right, but that's not assisted living, right? That's it's only it would only be apartments or condos or whatever. Or right, right. No, not the, assisted. I mean, well, the way the code reads now, um, it would be any any dwelling dwelling unit. Mm -hmm. 
well, it would be the, the three or four more family conversions, the attached single family, and the multifamily dwellings. And not the assisted living. And not the assisted well, Except I mean, you could, you didn't we say independent? Required. I thought. Yeah, independent would happen. It could happen. You could you, you could have a you could have an affordable requirement for assisted living. You might want to write if you, if you have it. You might want to write that in. Yeah, I looked into that after our last conversation, and I couldn't find a precedent for it for assisted or memory care. What about independent living? Independent living, I think. Yes. Yeah, it's independent yeah. living that definitely. That would be just like a condo because, then, right? Yes, yeah, just like a condo. Independent dwelling. Mm -hmm. Going on. <laughs> um, so we skipped over the parking regulations. I'm not sure if anyone has any questions about that. It would be 1.5 spaces per dwelling unit for attached single family and multi family unit, uh, one space per 100 square feet for small practice. This is all on page five in the, in the middle of the page. Um, one space per 100 square feet for small practice medical office one space for 250 square feet for office space, and then for all other uses, the applicant shall provide a parking demand study based on the Urban Land Institute shared parking methodology, Institute of Transportation Engineers, or American Planning Association recommended parking ratios, or existing conditions data from similar operations in the Hudson Valley region. So really, um, it's, it's putting the onus on, on the applicant to, to demonstrate what their needs are, so you're not overbuilding the parking. So I have a question. On some of these larger buildings, I mean, I, and I know that everyone's going to gasp at me, but what about if we allowed in-ground parking, mm -hmm. subgrade parking, to get the, so there's not open-air parking lots? How, what changes would that, besides having to change the definition of building height? I know, Wait, so actually, no, because it's not a living space. It's not a living space. Oh, okay. So underground parking, I think, would currently be allowed in your code. But one of the things that I did propose is um, uh, there is a, pro a prohibition on parking decks currently in the code. Okay. So notwithstanding the provisions of 224-55, parking decks are permitted to be constructed provided that they are fully shielded from view from all public rights of way and neighboring property lines. Any parking deck shall be fully screened by a liner building or topography. Landscaping alone shall be deemed insufficient for screening purposes. So a liner building means that you have a parking deck that's fully wrapped by a building facade. So you're not seeing an open <coughs> parking deck on any side. These sites, because of the topography, can lend themselves to building them into the topography so that you would be able to physically shield it from, from you. So either build a separate structure, uh, integrate structure of building the basement or the, the right. basement. I'm using. So you could have a situation where you have a liner building that you know goes around the parking decks in the back, and maybe you have the community pool on top. So that kind of a situation. So you'd have stepped parking, but it wouldn't be visible. I guess I'm just enthusiastic about removing surface parking wherever possible. That's right. I agree with you, Mark. Right. That's why we. Yeah. Suggest that yeah, something like this be included yeah, or considered anyway. And there's not it's not there's not a huge amount between the twenty and the twenty five percent coverage. Because that also includes that includes drive, everything driveways and patios and stuff. So there's not a lot of room for big sure. parking lots. I thought the yeah. driveways weren't covered. Mm -hmm. In coverage. Yes they are. They're covered under the they're not in, that they're not covered. They are considered in coverage, okay. and then if you look at single-family homes, it says that they don't, you don't count. That's okay. Fine. Thank you. But they are covered. Just avoiding looking at a whole meadow of cars would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But if you're going to do that, you yes. do have to, to allow change. for yeah. Yeah, some some other yeah some greatly screened. Um, You'd never know it was a parking structure, <laughs> structure right. of which we've all seen pictures from Seattle and elsewhere that do an amazing job. <laughs> we cover the next section. Um, on page six, there's we will be adding mixed use corridor. Oh, I, I mean, I wanted to say that I've, I've thought about this before. I know 
This, I don't think it's, uh, um, I think it would be nice if they have a more descriptive. Oh, a different know. name? Yeah, because it's a mixed use quarter. It's not really that long a quarter, you know? Yeah. So I just think a, more, a, a name more descriptive of what it is, like, you know, the North Broadway, Broadway zone, mm -hmm. you know, okay. something like that. <laughs> Preservation view <laughs> Well, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so we don't get too lost up on it. Too, too okay. into the outline. You know, just, I think I had it as North as Broadway Quarter work over there. No, yes, it's Broadway too long. Quarter, and I said, but it's not the it's whole not the Broadway Quarter, quarter so. and it's not really a mix. Yeah, views good. So does anybody have any other ideas? All I can think is like, you know, the North Broadway zone and, you know, it's not all North Broadway. East Broadway. It's just East North Broadway. Broadway. Northeast Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. Okay. Let's go to Walter Montgomery. <laughs> the worst. Okay. So, so the next section is just what, yeah, whatever name we end up settling on, it would be added to that section. Um, uh, on page seven, uh, this is a recommended change that would affect more than just the zoning district. Um, any change of use that would, by virtue of the new use, result in any increase in the generation of traffic or parking demand, uh, that would trigger uh, site development review by the planning board. So if somebody you reading what page on the bottom of page seven, seven oh, the double so under change of use that would. So, Everything that's double underlined is an edit to your existing zoning. So everything above that line is what's currently in your code. It tells you when site development plan approval is required. And she would add any change of use that would result in an increase in generation of traffic. So if you, for example, one of these. That's what she said. Oh, this is not, this is general, right? Okay. It would apply, it would apply to this line in general. general. Yeah. It's, a good, it's actually yeah, a good, good suggestion. And the, the reason I'm suggesting that if somebody were to adaptively reuse one of these right. buildings and that didn't require any change to the facade, that may not otherwise trigger a planning board review. And there may be instances where you want to take a look at it, have an opportunity to upgrade the landscaping, fix the parking lot, uh, it gives you a bite of the apple. Yeah. Didn't you want something when you want parking? Didn't you have a provision in there about parking? Oh, oh no. What was it? With, with traffic generation? Yes. So oh, yeah. that was related to the caps. What was like generate what meant a, a significant increase in traffic? Yes. That's page six, top of page six. Is to 100 new trips is that some sort of standard so that is new trips is a lot it, it does sound like a lot but that's actually mm -hmm. what um, what it, and it's during the peak hour um, that's tied to to DEC's guidance for um, what could be a potential significant impact that requires further investigation well, that would definitely be a problem during so school if days. they say they estimate 90 then you can't then you, you can't object on that basis. You, if, they, if they're below the threshold of 100, then it can't be objected to on that basis. Is that correct? Right. I mean, I, I would just anticipate requiring, if something was up at 90 under seeker, you could ask for analysis of the, the impact during the seeker process, but that wouldn't be the basis for... Well, here's the thing, like, rather than this is the single most bottleneck section of, in Irvington yeah. beyond beyond maybe Main Street at, at rush hour and morning. No, this is worse. This is, this is, because it's got High School Hill and the High School intersection, and it's got the Main Street intersection, and it's got... So one of the things that fits, figures into this is what the actual use is. So if you have a use that doesn't have a high peak hour traffic generation... Yeah. You, except when school gets out, <laughs> that's peak hour. Well, right. So. What you would have the applicant do is prepare a traffic impact study as part of your review of the application. Regardless. And during that process, <coughs> they would establish, based on um, ATR counts, what the peak hour is for that yeah. corridor. Yeah, you know the problem, really, I think, I think it's, it was nice to try to define when a significant increase is, but I think by putting it in the code, you're locked into it. Yeah. So if, you know, the planning board feels that's a significant increase at that time, that 
that um, the, the, the applicant would be able to say, wait a minute, it's fewer than 100, so you can't say there's a significant increase. So I think okay. putting that, I, I think you could leave. If, if we take out the 100, then I, Just would, I would add a significant increase that can't be mitigated. Because they may have a significant increase of traffic, but if they're proposing okay. mitigation measures... But well, they'd have to mitigate anyways in the seeker, right? Right. So you mean anything that the planning board or the community called out as being a major issue would require mitigation? Yeah, no, but, but what, if, if, if it read just will not result in a significant increase in traffic above present, above present levels, and then they, could do it's, like, they, they couldn't do anything, do anything <laughs> because those are mostly empty, they're mostly empty or underused properties or are used by, like it. Abbott House has like virtually no traffic. So somebody else wants to come up, there's going to be a significant increase in traffic. So that's why it would be important to add that language, right? unless it can be mitigated or whatever you suggested. I think that might be better and then not, not necessarily saying it's a hundred new peak hours. Yeah. Yeah. Throw into this that there we're also talking about um, reuse and reconfiguration of the Route Nine corridor with different lanes and bike lanes and turning lanes and you know so that's going to be happening around the same time as all of this and this that I think just argues for not locking us into a particular number. Okay. Yeah. Understood. Because the significant use might change if we have one fewer lane on Broadway. Right. Have you been following that whole proposal? It's all related to the new bridge. And there's a whole study of so the nine corridor. You, 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 you might, you know, you might okay. have to speak with the whole I didn't want to distract us. I didn't want to put it aside. I tried a couple times. But there's, there. a, oh, there's a path that I'm trying to there's a whole lot of things about bikes and how you get off the new bridge. There's bike and pedestrian on the bridge, off the bridge. So where are we? Up and down, in and out. <laughs> Changing uh, lanes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> more complicated. So we just finished the top of page six. We, we already covered the bottom of page six. And we covered seven. So then the last, uh, page eight, are the changes that would be made to the um, resource protection ordinance. Uh, and what it does is it adds, um, you know, we'll change the, the acronym if we change the name, but it adds uh, the density factor for this new district, uh, and that was, that's proposed to be 5,000 square feet, which is the same as the MF district in the village right now. Um, you see. <laughs> the book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well. <laughs> um, and then it also updates the definition of um, site capacity in that section to include. Uh, so right now, your site capacity analysis is expressed in dwelling units in the residential district, and either dwelling unit or floor area in the business district. Since this district allows both floor area and um, both business and residential uses or commercial and residential uses, it's added to the end of the business district. So that site capacity is defined in floor area and, um, and dwelling unit. So there's a new section that would be added to the resource protection code for, to um, define what those, what those capacities would be. Uh, for an attached single family and multi family uses, the site capacity in the mixed use corridor district shall be the net buildable area divided by the density factor of 5,000 square feet rounded down to the next lower number. And that's the same language that's used elsewhere in that section of the code for residential uses. Um, for all other special permit uses, the site capacity in the mixed use corridor district shall be the gross site area in square feet multiplied by the maximum FAR of 0.25 and rounded to the nearest whole number. The resulting number would be a maximum um, gross, sorry, yeah. would be the maximum square feet of gross floor area permitted on the site. So if you were to consider a, a bonus uh, for preserving historic structure or adding affordable housing, I think that's this is the section that we would update to capture that FAR bonus. Um, and then in the, in the next section, 
uh, it would be updating subdivision of land, it would update the recreation factor to include uh, this new zoning district. And in that case, again, it's proposed at 6,500 square feet, which is the same as the end of the square feet. Oh, sorry, 6,500. No, this is the dollars. The dollars. Right? Yeah. Did you really mean 6,000? I think you meant 6,500, right? Yeah, and it's a self unit. Mm -hmm. And 4,000 is a new, it's just moved. Oh, yes. Just so it stays in the um, numerical order. So, how does everyone feel about this kind of? I mean, I'm glad there's a maximum unit density, but some of these properties supporting 150 units is like it gives me pause. I understand that the ground can support that amount of units, but, but can the village area, that area, support? If some of these sites get burnt, built out, you're talking about 300 units with potentially uh, larger areas, and then you're talking about the impacts on traffic, you're talking about the impacts on, on uh, school district, and so forth and so on. This gives me some pause. Well, if it were a hotel, well, I guess that wouldn't be square right, Nothing's 150 for, is it for? Oh, and so you know which chart you didn't go over? Yeah, the, Everything. The, 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 the residential development. Right. Yeah, that's in your memo. Not in the zone. Well, that one. Miriam, what page do you want? It's on, if you go to her memo, it's right before the pictures, it's page five. Yeah. I'm just going to go to page five. So that tells you how many. So this tells you how many um, units you could get on, on each site. How, how many? So it would be a, the maximum would be on the on the Abbott House property would be 105, which is, works out to be six units per acre. Oh, oh these were non-residential, I guess. Yeah, this is residential. residential. How many residential right. you could right. get? And then on the, the smaller two lots that are both about an acre, it's nine and eight units, which is nine units per acre. Um, on the Maxon property, it'd be about 34 units, which is eight units per acre. Um, and just for comparison, on the lower table, table yeah. five, uh, I pulled the tax records on a bunch of the developments that are currently in the village. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's a range of some of the older developments uh, the MS zone just to the north of this site. That's currently 88 units in, the, in one complex and 109 units in the other complex. And that's 17 units mm -hmm. per acre and 12 units per acre. So this is um, it's significantly less. So it's, it's you know, higher than some of the more townhouse style developments in the village, like the ones on, on Valley View Road and Richmond, and Richmond Hill Road, but it's, it's not significantly greater. It's certainly significantly less than what's just north of the site. So now, if you're talking about impacts on the schools, Mark, those are the di those are yeah, the numbers we're looking yeah, at. Yeah. In terms of, yeah, I, you know, if you think of a hotel with 150 rooms, that seems like a lot. I I agree. Um, but it's not the same as. The but school. not not the same as a school. Yeah. I think we talked about the people tell me 100 max rooms. Yeah. So. Yeah. If you call it a boutique hotel, it has to be under 100. Well, there's, well, there's two different things we could do. We could, re, we could change the definition and we could change the maximum. You could just call it a hotel and then. Call it 100 for the last, yeah. Yeah, and but no hotel can have more than 100 rooms or whatever. Yeah. So, one of the other items that's in here to prevent you know, some of these larger properties from being subdivided and then individually maxed out mm -hmm. is on um, page three, the minimum lot requirements, uh, if you were to subdivide any of these into a new lot, would be 80,000 square feet. So that reduces the oh, double what you have right now. Oh, right. So that, that's on page three. Of the, of the zoning. Of the zoning, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, going back and forth. 
Um, so in the bulk regulations, um, and that's to discourage the subdividing and then building, maxing out yes, the individual that's sites. Definitely worth protecting against. We didn't have that as an issue, I'd say. Early on. So just to back it up a little bit and look at the big picture, we had a comprehensive planning process and we wanted to accomplish certain things in that area. Right. And what this does is try to enable that to happen, but with the maximum protection to the various factors that we are also committed to protecting. Exactly. So the goal is to have them step back from Broadway to make sure the development's not right up on Broadway, improve design restrictions. It increases the allowable uses in the area that are consistent with the uses in the comp plan, but proposes caps so that they don't push you over the traffic threshold. That's been a, a big concern. Andrew, let me just say something there. You say that this does not, no, this, you said does this propose the maximum protection? No, it doesn't propose the maximum protection. You have to decide is this the kind of, the, enough, enough protection. Yeah, it was wrong word. But, but, but protection is consistent with allowing the goals that we said we want in the comprehensive plan. You, you can't say we have a comprehensive plan that permits all these other stuff, but don't, don't change a thing. You know, right, so. Right. But I mean, that doesn't mean you, you couldn't say that, well, I think that's enough of a setback. Right. We can say we want greater protection in the I mean, direction that we talked about. Right. In your you could say you want more of a greater setback. You could say, uh, um, yeah, I mean, there's, you could say these buildings, they, they, we don't want buildings this big. Or you could live with buildings. I, mean, I guess the thing is, does this seem about, so go back does to it your seem about where you had your overall yeah, proposal? That's the question. Does it seem about right? And I think, yes, yeah, what you decided it seemed about right in terms of the uses, right? That, that these uses could work. The, the, these uses at this, these uses Level at these work. levels are, um, you know, the caps that are in there, the 150 unit caps, are reasonable caps for uh, a viable product. Um, it might not work for an individual property because of that particular constraints. Um, so, I mean, one thing we could take another look at if. It, if the, if the board thinks the coverage is too high or too low, that's something that can be adjusted. If the FAR is too high or too low, that can be adjusted. There can I'm be more concerned about the setback from Broadway. Setback from Broadway? And, okay. You know, I'd rather have allow a little bit higher FAR and still... Uh, I'm not saying that 0.25 isn't, but it seems about right for what you're doing, but I think that the setbacks from Broadway are the critical. So just as a uh, point of reference on lot, the existing building on lot three is about a, it's a 0.26 FAR. So that building on that lot maxes out that lot. Which lot? Which lot? That's that's the, the, uh, the, the term for right, the, the white building. Yeah. The white building. Yeah. Um, so when you say viable, you mean if some someone who owns that property or wants to develop it if the controls are so um, draconian that there's nothing viable economically to do with it, that's not, that's, is that your, the way you're looking at what's viable? So I'm, I'm looking at uh, when, when I suggested the unit caps of 150, I mean, most of the, a standard hotel going in would be around 100 units. Um, a assisted living facility, um, those run around 90,000 square feet. Um, so, and then, so that's, I mean, that's where some of these caps came from, was just the, the 150 um, was a reasonable cap for a, for a project that wouldn't push you into the traffic generation of the 100 units, the 100 peak hours. Um, 100 vehicles in the peak hour. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is if you if you suggested 150, say, hotel rooms in, a, in this location, and we're thinking, hmm, no, 100 sounds better. In your um, 
objective opinion? Does that make it not a viable economic investment opportunity for somebody who might want to build a hotel? Um, no, I don't think I could say that. No, I don't think I could say that. I don't. Because right, there'd be a point. There would be a point. point. There would be a point. point. Yeah. We said we don't want any hotel right. bigger than twenty-five rooms. Right. That's what I'm. Right. You're just saying in a hundred, you don't. You don't in a hundred, I don't know. Well, it also depends on property prices. Yes, I mean there's, there's Irvington and there's wherever. But I, I guess I'm, you know, obviously a developer can say, you know, we can't do this unless you give us a hundred and fifty-five. But that's yeah. a, I mean, there's that's gonna, not an objective person saying that. So I'm looking for somebody yeah. who's a there's so many varying the opinion about what is an egg, and maybe you know, I'm. It's. A, it's hard yeah, to answer that yeah, question yeah. without knowing, yeah. you know, what was paid for the property, yeah. what the construction costs yeah. are going to be, and what the site constraints are. Uh, there's a lot of variables that go into that. Because we obviously want to protect our community to the greatest extent possible, but we also don't want to be stuck totally in the past and say nothing can ever change here. Right. So, I mean, these guys are... Mark was bringing up the... Or nobody will even bother to bring a proposal. Oh, there has to be some kind of derelict building. So. That's kind of the whole reason of doing this. So yeah, yeah. yeah. What it is. Where is it? Yeah, right, right, right. And I, I know that's... that's but I, I'm just I trying have, to... I have numbers. So these, these yeah. numbers were, were reasonable. The 150 cap were based on... Um, industry trends in what's being constructed right now in this region. Like approximately, what's the maximum size of that type of building that's being built? And sure, I have a question just about when you talk about a hotel of 150 rooms as being some sort of in industry standard. In terms of space, does that include like dining areas, um, entry areas, kitchens? So the the 150 would, is just capping the units. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't address at all the proportion of space for right. a number of units to the number of um, common areas that you would have. Exactly. So, so. where that would be um, capped is by the gross floor area, which has a cap. So, you know, an individual developer is going to have to weigh how much of the space they want to dedicate to community amenities versus um, units. Can you explain how you ended up with these numbers at all, is is the very first draft had numbers, had, no, had no maximums. And I, and I said, based on what? Well, and then I said, what? Well, it seems to me, why don't you come up with the size of building that seems reasonable for each of the sites, you know, overall, the size of building, and then what could fit into that uh, right. building of that size. And so then that's how she came to the numbers. Some of the numbers turned out to be too high to be, you know, to work, you know, to be too high. That's why there was the cap. But so it, it was the focus because that was the concern, right? It's the, the look. So you, you, you arrive at the look you want, and then what can fit in building right. Right. that right. size. Right, start with that. Right, and so then, it started and with the box. That's what it came right. up. It started with right. the box, and then what would fit in that box. So, what, so you you can have a uh, a higher end, more space on common rooms and wide corridors and lots nice of amenities and, and, and restaurants and, and salons and massage and I don't know what, but and fewer rooms, thus probably less traffic. So you can, you know. But, that's a different kind of project that, you know, that might be more appropriate than one that tries to stuff in as many rooms in its box as possible. Not for us. Right. But I don't know how. Uh, yeah, how, how, do you, how do you encourage that kind of thing? Right, style? how do you encourage that? <laughs> you, you say, you, you know. You partially encourage it by lowering from 150 down to 100. Yeah, so you say there are fewer rooms yeah. allowed, and then you have a greater. Maybe 75, just right. because the industry standard in other places is yeah. 150. Right, so that's, what I, that's, that's kind of where I was going, going, Larry. Yeah. But make it, make it a different um, allocation of that space. People comfortable. <laughs> 
I mean, because Ashley will look at him. Yeah, see it sounds it like it's 100 sense. for the hotel room. Well, I don't know. I mean, we're just saying that because it's a round number. But. Well, that was, the, that was the, the definition of a boutique hotel is 100 rooms or less. So we always talked about a boutique hotel. We did, right? So I was back. It was a boutique hotel. It's 10 to 100 is what they said. There. So we could pick a different number. <laughs> and, and who is that? <laughs> Ten is, uh, it's, it's it's so you, yeah, I mean, you already have the hours in your industry. Well, then I, I, I certainly think going hey. down to a hundred. Why don't, why don't you look at look at seventy five, look at an, okay. an eighty, and a hundred seems they yes, seem right. So, a hundred seems like the the top, but some of those other tops might be better tops. <laughs> Yeah. And what about on the other, on the on the other thing that the uh, the other assisted thing living assisted living and correct. I think we always we always came back to like it was like ninety was the magic number for right here. It was not the that's yeah. the one that they wouldn't go. Where's the table? Table five is that the one? Oh, that, no, table sorry. three. Table three. Well, right. interestingly, that with the assisted living, that's what it comes up with. Right, right. and that's what I said okay. was interesting so, to me. Yeah. Because it was like right. we were feeling gut level that one twenty was too much still, and we were trying to how to push it down even lower. No, but, but wait a minute. They, they were talk, they were talking they about bags, though. Weren't they? Were they talking about bags or units? This is, this is this rooms, unit. right? This is rooms. This is units. It could be more bags. Sure, some percentage more beds. We can, we can look that back up, I guess. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. Assisted living is single rooms. Memory care can be doubles. Assisted living, okay. Oh, independent living is where you could have. Oh, yeah, rooms. that's true. Independent was the. Yeah, and where you have like bedrooms. So, I mean, some of the memory care units now have um, like suites so the spouse can stay. Mm -hmm. so, I, don't, I don't know the number, but um, comparison to what we thought about before, I guess, would make some sense. If we look at that final proposal, well, we'll see you if know, it was, was, it, was, it, was, it, was it 120 beds or one? I think it was 120 beds. Beds. It was 120 beds. It was 90 units and 120 beds. So was, that included the memory care. Wait, where they were? Where they were? At. Oh, but the, the truth is, by the very end, I think people were reasonably yeah. satisfied yeah. with it. But they just decided because to three walk. Was, it's it's not a big project. Right, so that's right. was right. concern. It was with right. them. It was just about the, the massing of the building. Okay. So I mean, the other thing to look at with that line, I mean, the, the building's capped at eighty-eight thousand square feet. So you know, once you, it would be some factor between you know, the eighty-eight together, and they might dedicate more of that space to um, amenity space. So it could be that would bring it down. Um, yeah, because you, I think that number's small. I actually think that 15 percent of the gross floor area is it's too small. Is, I, it just well, I think it's going to be small. It's based on some of the, the things we saw. They have like, you know, movie rooms. Yeah, I mean, a super high-end one might have a higher percentage. Well, but this so. is just trying to give you a, a yeah. Case. You probably most likely what you're going to get here because the properties are so expensive. It's going to be high-end. Because here's the issue. If you remember Brightview. I distinctly remember they had two restaurants and two movie theaters okay. and two of everything because one was for, the, that for, that for memory one care and one was for. Yeah, I've got the plans right here. From the beginning of the end, it changed a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it was a moving target. Yeah. Isn't, it, isn't, it, isn't it another workshop? I, I'm not going to research no, it now. <laughs> I've got all the documents. Oh, yeah, but I've got all the documents here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ashley, if you don't find it out there, I think it might be. Let me know because I've got all the files. Okay, all the files. I mean, for a first pass, and this is really the, this is the first time we looked yeah, at this right. as a group, um, as well as discussed it. You know, I think to me it's a it's a heck of a start for something that seemed like you know I, I didn't frankly know where to start. Right. So, yeah. Um, no. It's, you know, this is a, I think this is a very practical way to do it. I think having some more kind of um, ground view, bird's eye views, is important. Um, so I think that was that was to us that was the key to the whole Brightview proposal was you know the architecture got better and, and to me the, the the number of rooms and the number of beds and all that stuff was okay for me it was literally just the setback and the 
the looming nature over Broadway. So I think that, you know, trying right. to get and some... They, and they did. Because of the way they ended up by doing the subfloor, they ended up getting a lot of space and they could reduce the front facade, the impact of the front facade. They pushed it. Now, I seem to remember it was 250 feet back, but maybe it was... Yeah, we'll double check that too. So I think that's the one, you know, we spent so much time on that, we can, we can you kind of re recycle those numbers. Do you know what the current building is now? How many feet it's set back? Or the white building? Um, it looks like it's got to be at least 350 feet. Yeah, it's probably about 350, because this is a 125. So it's probably about 300, because yeah. it went up a little bit. I think yeah, it was probably it came about forward. 300. It did come forward some. Because, yeah, I think originally it was like, it went forward by 100 feet, and then they moved it back. I, I, yeah, I think it was about 300. We can go with that. Because that's when they realized that they could actually build it using the slope to their benefit. Yeah. And if it if it I don't know if it matters in here, but the idea of the um, the totally screen doesn't look like a parking structure structure that might make some project more viable. I don't have an objection to that. Um, I don't think any of us are objecting. Okay, right. It's, no. But it's, it it is in the code right now. Well, we'll be all lined up against the fire and square squad wall, but I don't think we're objecting to that. I think, uh, I think what makes sense is maybe make some of these, you know, see see what kind of, uh, you know, feedback you've got. <laughs> Interpretive and everything. Um, then we did this again at another work session. I have to say that I agree, Brian. This is very nice. This is very nicely done. I didn't expect it to be at this <laughs> degree of comprehensibility. Yeah, and I think it's much quicker than I thought. I was like, no way she's going to get done this quickly. Uh, yes, thank I think you. This was really I, clear, very helpful, and this was very I, I love your little pictures of what FAR means. <laughs> if you could send that to me, and whenever somebody mentions it, I'm going to use it as a cheat You got oh, yeah. it. I know. I, I have it, yes. Sure. You can't I'll keep it here. I'll just yeah. No, you have it electronically. I keep it under I'm kind of joking, but I, every time I think that, I, somebody explains it to me, and I go like, oh, I forget how, how you figure that. So anyway, yeah. some of us. Are, I mean, we talked about like, trees and birds smarter than this stuff you do. I think. Uh, yeah. On the right people, so. Okay. We're also. I was also thinking about the beautiful idea we had once about the landscaping being not a lawn but a, a meadow, and it was so much more environmentally um, appropriate than just lots of grass and grass and grass and I don't know if that's something you just encourage or you that's a put it in yeah, okay. yeah but I mean the, the plan the code as drafted um, would require a detailed landscaping plan right. part of the project right just every time I look at the acres of, of regular lawn I think Silly, <laughs> silly. Why not have you know more natural plants? They look better. Keep discussing it themselves. Yeah. Pollinator yeah. pathways. <laughs> okay, we're gonna say that the next. Okay, I'm done. Thanks. This is a great, yeah. this is a great initial shot at this, and you know, take another shot at it. Uh, you know, the bulk for public comment and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but this was a great first shot. Yes, nicely done. Yeah. Give some context. Something that we have a lot of context on. Okay. And I missed it. I heard I missed a good discussion. All right. Bye, sir. 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 Bye, Bye, sir. Short term, at least that part worked out fine. Yeah, sounds like. And what you just said? Uh, we just said that. Yeah, yeah. That's the day we. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, I get to change. Back to my water bottle. Okay. You want your water? I can. No, I'm going to come back. Oh, okay. I was keeping your other stuff, but we can come back. I would um, stay here. Give me this water. Let me stay down here. It's hard. Yeah, no, it's hard. It's hard. Got to finish. Got to finish. <laughs> we want to watch what you're doing. This is a middle school class. All the boys in the middle school class.
Puritan uh, meeting. So right, right. Uh, okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So, what did I miss? <laughs> we have a replay of the meeting up there if you'd like. We were planning to, but we kept saying without Brian. No, I'm not going to. We're not going to do anything. You know, I. I, I sent an email earlier. The highlighting didn't come out on, on the. Yeah, but yeah, go to page three. Uh, those are the only two. Um, okay, in any remember, Brian Janison suggested that. Um, this language, or whatever, you know, this idea. For at least 90 of the 180 days, the owner and lessee of the dwelling must be physically in residence at such dwelling during periods in which the rooms are rented. And there was some. What was, yeah, what was the uh, what was the problem we were solving for with the additional with that new language? Yeah, I'm sorry. The problem we were solving for with the 90 days of people in the house. Ownership of the building for the sole purposes of SGR use. Okay. So we were hearing from two different groups, right? The people who didn't want to their wasn't there, and the people who were trying to make, you know, to stay in their homes yep. by generating more income, and the people who were using it, obviously it's always making money, but as a really an investment opportunity, and people who are trying to have people there while they're there so they can stay in their homes. And this seemed to, at least to me, I, as I said, this inspiration came when I was walking the dog to try to um, <laughs> split the. Well, uh, hear both sides. I mean, one lady stood up at the end and said, 180 days, that's like every other night I'm going to have a new person next door. Well, no, I mean, you do have to wash the sheets. But, um, and I understand why 180 days makes sense in terms of you're paying for um, the inspection and you're going to have to make some investment probably in order to possibly bring it up to code and all of the rest. But I, it seemed to me this was one way to try to address both concerns. Oh, and, and Brian, there was some disagreement. That's why I, we, we yeah. decided what we would do is put the language in and people could look at it and see how it fits in, and then that would, we would discuss it tonight. What was the disagreement? Well, well, this, this is what I was thinking about. Um, not, you know, I, I get where you're coming from, and I get the, you know, there are, there are different points of view. But my feeling is the people that don't want this, that don't want 90 days, they don't want 180 days. They, it's that they don't want people on their block in, the, in their neighborhood that they don't know. It's not that the owner is there or not there so much as these are people that are just coming unknown. You know, they don't know the, you know, the, the, the going slow on that street. They don't know that there is, that they, they don't know a lot of things. So I don't know that this solves the problem of the people who don't want it, but it does create that, you know, concern about the economic um, burden of the person who's, yes, they're, they're doing their, their short-term rent. But if I'm going to bother to do this and get the maybe fire escape, maybe, you know, pay the fee and all that, you know what, I can't do it. I'm not going to do it unless I know I can set it up this way. And, you know, that they're, we know they have to be, they have to have somebody available. That's, I mean, that's that's a big part of you have to but solve the problem. What we so, don't want this to be is an alter, alternative investment opportunity to create effectively uh, a new kind of uh, hotel or for bed and breakfast that, by another name. Mm, I, I'm not just, thinking of it that way. I'm thinking of that person. Well, that's how I'm thinking about it. Well, yeah, that's why that's I'm saying. Well, I'm thinking of it as With a person. person. <laughs> no, I, I, I get that. I think of of you know renter a and and she she knows when she has her place rented she stays with her mother you know she's nearby but she's not in the house so it, it, it but right? that doesn't preclude some 
include the investment? Do we make it? Do we make it so that it has to be their primary residence? It does have to be their primary residence. It's already happened. Yes. Basically, how do you prove primary? So would somebody come? Revoke everything? I don't know. So we come in and you buy. I'm trying to think through your problem, and I, you know, I really, I'm, I'm trying to listen. Maybe, maybe I agree with it. But I think I think they can't buy three houses in a row. No, they rent them out because they can't all be their primary residence. They can't all be your primary residence. So they can buy two houses. Well, they both can't be their primary residence. Right, only one can be your primary residence. They can't rent them both out for 180 days. But they could be living in one and renting out the other. Uh, calling it their primary residence. Well, that's against the law, right? No, but, you could, but, but you could live in, in, in Dobbs Ferry and buy a house in Irvington and, uh, and split split it in some way. I mean, aren't there people that have two homes and go from both places by mistake? They don't do it necessarily on purpose, but... Um, I don't think you can both be a primary residence. Yeah, yeah. The voting voting you is is where you make your domicile. Yeah. That's what they that's the wording yeah. that's used in the law, from what I remember. Used for a lot of things. But, yeah. but that also well, but but taxes then well, starts to yeah. get to uh, actual well, days are, yeah. and yeah, there's, there's lots of different things. Um, so we, when we started the discussion, we said 90 days. That's what we were prepared to permit, and then we were we pushed it up, um, and I wasn't comfortable, but. What, but we pushed it up because of the costs involved right. Right. and because of the compelling case of the people who really needed to stay. Uh, my impression was that we were looking to push up the number of days to allow people to make more money off their houses so much as to allow people to stay in their houses. It seemed to me a balance. Uh, it's right, if you're not, it's fine if you push it up to 180 so they can stay in their houses, but they're not staying in their houses. Then, well, on the week, on those days, on those yeah, days. that's half a year though. They're not staying in their house. It's kind of like that's why I thought it made sense to me to put some. I don't really have a strong feeling either way, to be honest, because I, I I think that ninety nine out of hundred of these rentals are not going. We're not even going to know they're happening. You know, like and and this goes to the next thing that was the only time we've ever had a complaint about any of these. Was it because someone was staying in the house and they didn't know not to go slow? That there's yeah. a child that lives on the end that you know plays on his tricycle, yeah, yeah. Right. and it's crazy that there's this transit thing right, going right, on. Right. It was all about B, um, which is completely unrelated to short-term rental. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that's necessarily true. Um, I think that we're talking about again the bad actor in B, but I think in A there, there are people that complain. There's there's people that complain, that complain about the, what's happening on the theory though yeah. that there's going to be these people from right. you know Florida yes. coming and right. staying on my block and they're not going to notice. So okay. I think that so I think that's why this uh, suggestion by Janice I think is what is which is fine which is fine and making everybody unhappy which means we're probably in the right place if <laughs> both sides are not. I, I, I frankly don't care. care. But how does it address? I'm sorry, but how does it address? The, the fact that 180 of those days it's people they're from other towns don't know. There's 90 of them, there's the person being home monitored, you know, directly monitoring that activity. That as opposed to them not being there. Yeah, and I also and, think. And again, I agree that mm -hmm. for a person who doesn't want anybody there, mm -hmm. but at least we're saying to them, we hear you, we're just not doing what you want. We're, we're compromising in some way. And giving you a, a bit of what you want, but not what you want, because we're not going to outlaw it. I do, I do think that the vast majority of people are either going to have a six month sublet, which they don't have to worry about this at all, because it's more right. than 30 days, yeah. or they're going to do it much less than 90 days anyway. So I, I actually think this is something we're arguing about yeah. in theory on both sides. Right. The theory that I'm going to be able to run the greatest Airbnb yeah. and pay off everything. And right. then the theory that there's going to be every night and I have 180 different people that are going to want to stay on my house on Riverview Road in Irvington. Like, none of it, none, it's to be both, both sides of it. They're not you got to get a better house. Seriously. Yeah. 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 For the nice pool in the back or something. Yeah, so, exactly. to, me, to me, we could start. That's why, to me, 90 days versus 180 days. How many people I were actually going to successfully rent it for 180 days? That wasn't. The whole I'm gone for the whole summer, which just doesn't it doesn't even apply. If it's yeah, more than you, 30 you want, days. You want to rent you your house, house for three months? You rent your house for three months. You don't even. You don't have to worry about. You don't have to worry. About 90 days is as the people during the discussion. 90 days is like every weekend. That's exactly right. a lot. Mm -hmm. But we're saying you could with letting you do that. So to me, this is almost like a moot point. Like I, either one, you can have it with or without. Because like, I don't think it's going to be a practical thing. So I, I think it's I think this is fine if it makes a couple people. 
less nervous about. I it just I think it helps that we hear we hear what the concerns are, and we, we have two different interest groups. We have several interest groups, but in terms of the people who are going to do this. I guess that, that again, I'll just say again, I don't think that the people who really don't want this will feel any comfort by this. No. So um, if that's the goal, I don't think we've achieved it. Um, We're not going to make everybody happy. Do we, when, we have never made everybody happy. <laughs> no. so. The problem here is it's one of those items that I don't think is enforceable. So. I'd rather, you know, leave it by our language. I'll stick with that and not change it, but, you know, um, I'll. Yes, we need, okay. I'm not sorry. Straw, I think it's all about that. We need to vote on it for, you know, for the draft. Well, is, is it, does anyone see it as enforceable? That's the question I have. Well, I'm going to go back to. <laughs> most people do everything. Most people obey the law. Well, but the people who don't, you know, it could, yes, it could be tricky to enforce, but the thing is, most people follow the law. And if they're afraid they're going to lose their right to do it, it's going to be a But I think it's true. Bit more. That used to be true. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's a different world, true. right? <laughs> Hopefully it will be true sooner than later. Yeah. All right. So, Janice, you're looking at the language. Did you have some issue with the it said the intent is that you can rent it out for 90 days if you're not there. Well, it says for at least 90 of these days. It can be rented out for 180 days. For at least 90 of these days, the owner must be physically pregnant. But for the first 90, they don't. So you can rent it for 90 days without you being there. It's, it's just yeah, true. It, it says that. Okay. Okay, so I know how we, you, you, you're voting yay. Okay. I'm, voting, I'm voting against that change. Okay, okay, fine. You don't care. Yes, you're right. Yes. You got to vote. <laughs> no, you can't I'm just kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, he, he, right he, he, I'd say yeah. Okay, so, so then, all right. So, so if you remember the one thing, too, the one, the one argument against this that Leova was trying to give, she actually so saying, uh, undermined herself. Yeah, she it, said, you, you, you rooted her out on that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. She said she could actually handle it by discussions. But right. Then, which is the right answer. Okay. All right. Let's go on. And then, then the other one, um, okay, the, the language now reads, a short-term rental Which may not be used to host the, parties. The next paragraph. B. The, or other gatherings or events at the dwelling. And Nikki suggested this language. Luncheons, banquets, parties, weddings, meetings, charitable fundraising, commercial or advertising activities or other gatherings for direct or indirect competition compensation. I don't really like that language because I don't want to get into whether the direct no. or indirect compensation. Luncheons, dinners, breakfast, cocktail parties, I mean, brunches. I look at all of these things Soiree. and I think it's covered by parties or a luncheon, you know, a <laughs> banquet, <laughs> gatherings, and parties. I mean, if you want to say you something like Definitely, you have to leave something out with this list. I mean, if you say host any kind of parties or other gatherings. I mean, I'm looking at a like couple that. things like to host weddings, parties, meeting, banquets, meetings, or other I mean, gatherings. Other gatherings seems to cover everything. Yeah, I, I, it's a baby reveal party, and I'm having brunch. That doesn't count, you know. <laughs> no, but these, no, this said list party. Doesn't, has to be, doesn't have to be written as being. Uh, no, but what happens, Mark, is when pe people say. It's not on this list. I know it's not like that. Oh, including but not limited yeah. to. It's, that just gets. It's, yeah, it's problematic. Why well, that works in English? <laughs> it works in English, but not in yeah, the law. We've always, we've always been at least. Which of these things advisors. wouldn't be okay? A luncheon? It may or may not be a problem. Right. I mean, we don't care. I can imagine. It's it's the real real okay. It could be. It's a little okay. A banquet. That's, that's, it's either a party it's or a gathering. Right. Parties, or events. weddings, weddings. weddings. See, if you put weddings and then you don't put rehearsal dinners, I think it's different. You know? But are you it's for right. anniversary, you anniversary parties, bridal showers, sweet sixteen. You know, no, you're talking about bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs. Leave one out. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> you say bar mitzvahs, maybe you could have a bat mitzvah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, 
<laughs> okay, so I'm I know people like to, you know, but, but sometimes I think, I think less is more. I mean, and I, I know she did, I, maybe, I, I don't remember, she said she found this in the language from some law. Yeah, some other Seattle, I think. Or yeah. Either in Seattle or in Seattle. So I, I, I mean, I, I understand where she's coming from, and it's, 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 it's nice for us to bring it up and think about it, but I'm going to defer to Mary Ann's view of the law. Consistent with this, that we don't. Let it. We don't, I think the common sense thing says we make a list so people know what you're talking about, but then you're, you're actually shortchanging yourself. Yeah. So are we actually? This got me thinking. I'm, okay. So without, I'll leave this the way it was. Are we? Still are we uh, so we're, we're saying you can't have like a charitable event. It's, a, it's a, an Airbnb, yeah. Yes, when you when you are renting your place as an Airbnb, you can't do that. Yes, yes. What about if I wanted to have a charitable event there but didn't post it? I'm trying to get at could they still use the the house for a charitable event but just have it? If they weren't getting paid for it? If, no, if they weren't. Well, listen, see, that's why you don't want to get direct or indirect Right, I'm just. I'm sorry, I'm not going. So they're not using an Airbnb. You or, can't have events. You can't have gatherings. And if your charitable, charitable event involves gathering, you can't do it. You can do it at your house, right. but you can't rent it out to somebody and let them do it. Yes, there's a limitation here. You can have a, or a, a the Octagon house. Yeah. He can host the Historical Society event, but he can't but rent it to Larry it. to have his hockey fundraiser. Right. <laughs> Shut Sorry, Larry. Sorry, Larry. That's okay. We'll find somewhere else. <laughs> On Riverview <laughs> Road, probably. <laughs> Like a pond in my All right, good. Well, then, we're, are we okay we're with this then? All right, okay. okay. I'm okay with this then. So then, I'm going to make this. Yeah, make this yeah. Yeah. That's that's yeah. You guys did a lot of good work on boy. Because <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't away. I was at work. Okay. All right. Yeah, so, so you're on the way. Yeah, we're, we're done. Yeah. So you're going to adjourn, right? Oh, you're yeah. I'll make a motion to adjourn if I have a second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.